Well, good morning and welcome. Uh, we want to honor what's going on this weekend as we uh, celebrate and think about Veterans Day and uh, how we're going to do that here this morning. We're going to ask that you would rise in honor of the, the nation's flag. Flag of the United States of America. Salute the flag to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please face the Christian flag. Salute and fight the flag. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands, one brotherhood uniting all Christians in service and in love. Please face the Holy Bible. Salute. Recite the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet light into my path and hide his words in my heart that I may not sin against God. Thank you. Let's uh, pray together. Our Father, what a privilege it is to know you, to be in your kingdom, to be a citizen of yours. And by your great grace and your providence this morning, you've placed us, your people, here in America a country that is, even right as we pray and speak right now, is being protected uh, by men and women who are uh, serving in various branches of our military, men and women who have served, uh, that we're able to honor this morning. God, I pray that they would be honored today, but I pray more than that, that you'd be glorified in how you've graciously given them to us today. Uh, we love you and we trust you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you. Y'all can take a seat. And we do want to, uh, we have a special gift for any of our veterans today. We want to be able to honor them in particular. So we're going to do so by a branch uh, of military. So if you served in, the, in a branch of military that I, I stay, if you'll please either stand or raise your hand or remain standing until you get one of these tokens um, that we'll give out to you this morning. So if you served in the National Guard, will you please stand? If you served in the Coast Guard, will you please stand? If you served in the Army, will you please stand? If you served in the Navy, will you please stand? If you served in the Air Force, will you please stand? And if you served in the Marine Corps, will you please stand? Let's honor these men and women. And if I could get the kids to come help pass out these coins to anybody that's standing, okay? We've got one right there, too. Let me take that to Mr. Brian over there. Take it to Mr. Brian. Thank you all very much. I think the kids have a song to sing as well.
let's take a hymn book now and turn to hymn number 584 as we stand and sing, Come into His Presence, or the words will be on the screen. <coughs> remember we're singing praises to Jesus right now so uh, we were a little bit I was a little bit off getting started so let's try this again okay <laughs> church i hope you're doing well glad to have you here with us this morning i hope that you will find yourself welcomed by our church family and that you'll learn and be encouraged by god's word uh, before we leave today if there's any guests with us this morning just want to say thank you for coming uh, thank you for uh, choosing to worship with us and over the course of the service if you have uh, any questions along the way about our church family or if you have any things that we can be praying for you about or any needs that we can help meet, uh, we'd love to, to connect with you after service. You can fill out a card. should be a guest card in the back of a pew near you. You can fill that out and either leave it in your seat when you leave today, or you can put it in the offering plate as it passes by, and we'll connect with you after service. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Got a handful of announcements. Uh, I, don't, I won't have time to read all of them from the bulletin, but I do want to highlight a couple of them that are... Um, that are pressing uh, soon. Uh, one is that we'll be voting on the proposed 2025 budget uh, this Wednesday night, I believe. Yes, this Wednesday night uh, during that worship service. We'll be voting then, so please take a copy of that budget. It should be one in the foyer on your way out. And if you have any questions, uh, reach out to the listed people uh, the, of the Finance Committee in the bulletin. I also want to remind everybody about the Feast and Praise service that we have, in, that we have every year. And so in a couple of weeks, we'll be having our um, feast portion of that at 6 o'clock that night on Wednesday night. Uh, if you'd like to bring something for that, a side item, or if you'd like to uh, cook, I think we have two turkeys that still need to find someone to cook them. Uh, so if you would like to, to do that for us, uh, please let us know. And I think there'll be a sign-up sheet in the foyer as you leave on the right. That'll happen at 6, and then we'll have a worship service afterwards, which is a time of testimony to tell about how good God is and what he's done in your life. And so this is a special service for us and our church family. I also want to uh, point everybody's attention to the Joy Closet announcement there. They're doing a, a Christmas toy drive uh, for uh, our community. And so if you bring in a gift on that, on that date, you can get, get a free um, Christmas picture taken, which is a pretty good deal. So if you'd like to update your, um, update your family photo, your Christmas photo, please come by that day and uh, donate an item. and You'd be able to, to get one of those pictures taken. I also want to let everybody know about the, the ladies' annual Christmas party. It will be happening on December 5th at the 6 p.m., so please mark that in your calendar so you can make, uh, make plans to come. And then we have plenty of Christmas things going on, but two more things. Uh, one, the, the children are working on a Christmas play called The Signs of Christmas, and they're going to perform that play on December 18th, Wednesday night at 7 o'clock for our worship service that night. Uh, so please make plans to come, invite friends and family to come and see what they've got uh, put together for you all. And then lastly, we'll be having a Christmas Eve service uh, this year on Christmas Eve at 7 o'clock that night. It'll be a candlelight, traditional candlelight service. We'll also observe the Advent candles as well during that. So please, uh, we ask that you make that a part of your uh, Christmas tradition this year 
And I think we have one more announcement from, from Heather. Good morning. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody that came out last night for the Lottie Moon fundraiser and the Baptist Children's Home fundraiser. We collected $1,230 that will be split equally amongst those two offerings. Um, so just continue to pray about what God would have you to give. Um, the Baptist Children's Home will collect the last Sunday in November, and then Lottie Moon will collect throughout the month of December. Um, in your bulletin this morning, you should have found a little um, insert with a little picture. These are pictures that were taken by Samaritan's Purse for Operation Christmas Child. Um, you should have a little personal note on the back of yours. Um, so just put that in your Bible and just think about <clears throat> what um, our shoeboxes are doing around the world. And next Sunday is our end gathering for our shoeboxes. Right now we have 92, so we are only eight short of our goal. So if you would like to pack a box, we still have boxes available, and the cards are there um, on the little rail behind them. So I would love for us to reach our goal of 100 and just be in prayer as we send those around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. And anybody who would like to go to the um, distribution center in Boone, I'll have you taking a trip on the 13th, and there's three spots left. So if you'd like to be one of those three spots, please let Jeffrey uh, or myself or Heather know, and we'll make sure that you get the information that you need. Uh, let's turn our attention now to God's Word. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 will prompt our prayer this morning. 1 Peter chapter 2. It should be on the screen. This verse 17, this is what God's word says to us as people. Honor all men. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Let's pray together, church. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our highest honor, our highest love and devotion be to you and to you alone. And in your wonderful kindness, you've told us to honor all who are worthy of it. You've told us to love the brotherhood of believers that are sitting right next to us. You told us to, uh, to do these things. And so this morning, God, we want to praise you for the veterans who have faithfully served our country. Whether on the battlefield or handling logistics or something in between, you have used them to protect our freedoms this morning. And this morning we want to offer a special prayer of praise for those men and women who not only served our country but now serve your church. We ask God that you would bless their efforts as they bless us. Help us, dear Father, to honor, to love, and to serve as you have called us to do as we reflect the perfect honor, love, and service of your Son, Jesus. It's because of his grace in our lives that we offer this prayer and give you our tithes and offerings this morning. We love you and we trust you. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.
continue our praise service this morning. If you'll turn to hymn number 149. Praise him, praise him as we stand and sing together. <laughs> Our special this morning is called My Tribute, and Pastor Chris will be singing the solo part. done for me, things so undeserved, yet you give to prove your love for me, the voices of a million angels could not express my gratitude, all that I am and ever hope to be I owe it all to Oh. 
just let me live my life. Let it be pleasing, Lord, to Thee. And should I gain any praise, let it go to Calvary. With His blood. At this time, the kids are dismissed uh, to nursery and the children's church. If you are three years old and younger, you'll go back through this door and to the left to nursery. If you're four years old to second grade, you can go to the stairwell, and our teachers will take you down to children's church. And if you're the pastor, you're going to find your Bible and your iPad real quick before you get started. First Samuel chapter 29 is where we're going to be this morning. We're getting closer to the end of this book. See you, baby. First Samuel chapter 29. I think, um, I think chip companies are a bunch of hypocrites. Now, if now I've got your attention, let me tell you why I think they're a bunch of hypocrites. They claim one thing, but they do something else. They give you a big old bag, and they claim that there are chips inside that bag, but you know what they give you? 80% air. air and 20% chips. We bought one of these the other week at Walmart. I mean, a big one, family party size bag that was supposed to be full of those wavy chips. It was well under half full. I was, oh man, I was so frustrated. I've been frustrated ever since. I, I, I joke a little bit about that, but... We can all agree that hypocrisy is something that we really have no tolerance for. People that claim to be one thing, but in actuality are something completely else. It's frustrating to deal with. It can be impossible to trust uh, someone who's like that. So praise God that we're not like those sinners, are we? <laughs> right? Unfortunately, more times than not, we are. We all have a vein of hypocrisy that runs right through us. And what I want us to see this morning from the text is that double-faced David, he's going to be on full display. And even for people like him, especially for people like us, there is hope. There is hope. The main point of the sermon is this, that Jesus offers hope for hypocrites like us. Jesus offers hope. For hypocrites like us. Will you look with me? 1 Samuel chapter 29, beginning in verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered together all their armies to Aphek, and the Israelites pitched by the fountain which was in Jezreel. And the lords of the Philistines passed on, on by hundreds and by thousands. But David and his men passed on in the re reward with Achish, and said, and then said the princes of the Philistines, What do these Hebrews hear? And, the Ach and Achish said unto the princes of the Philistines, Is not this David, the servant of Saul, the king of Israel, which hath been with me these days or these years? And I have found no fault in him since he fell unto me unto this day. The princes of the Philistines were wroth with him, and the princes of the Philistines said unto him, Make this fellow return, that he may go again to his place which thou hast appointed him, and let him not go down with us to battle, lest in the battle he be an adversary to us. For wherewith should he reconcile himself unto his master? Should it not be with the heads of these men? Is not this David of whom they sang one to another and dances, saying, Saul slew his thousands and David his ten thousands? Then Achish called David and said unto him, Surely as the Lord liveth, thou hast been upright, and thy going out and thy coming in with me in the host, of, in, in the host is good in my sight. 
For I have not found evil in thee since, my, since the day of thy coming unto me unto this day. Nevertheless, the Lord's favor thee not. Wherefore now return and go in peace that thou displease not the lords of the Philistines. And David said unto Achish, But what have I done? And what hast thou found in thy servant so long as I have been with thee unto this day? That I may not go fight against the enemies of my lord the king. And Achish answered and said to David, I know that thou art good in my sight. As an angel of God, notwithstanding, the princes of the Philistines have said, He shall not go up with us to the battle. Wherefore, now rise up early in the morning with thy master's servants that are come with me. And as soon as ye be up early in the morning and have light, depart. So David and his men rose up early to depart in the morning to return to the land of the Philistines. And the Philistines went up to Jezreel. Let's pray together, church. Oh, Father, would you help us this morning to be encouraged, to be challenged, to be sanctified and strengthened by your Holy Spirit through the, the presence of your word. We love you. and We trust you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. There are 2,326 people who live in Jonesville, North Carolina. That's according to Google. I'm assuming it's relatively right. If Jonesville is a typical reflection of North Carolina, that means that 77% of the people that live here would call themselves Christian. This leaves 767 people just in our little town that would have no claim on Christianity. And if we're doing our job, church family, of making disciples by the gospel for the glory of God, then we ought to be asking ourselves the question week in and week out, why? Why have those... Who have rejected Jesus and gone away from his church or have no interest in him at all. Why? Why are they far from him? Well, I want to shed a little bit of light on that this morning. The number one reason that people do not believe in Jesus is because they simply believe in something else. Whether that is atheism, Judaism, Buddhism, they follow some other belief system. So our response as the local church to them is simply to preach Jesus. Tell them to trust the Holy, tell them about what Christ has done and trust the Holy Spirit to do what he does. That's not what I want to talk about this morning. I want to talk about reason number two. The second reason, most common reason, that people, particularly in North Carolina and in this area, do not trust Jesus is because they've been hurt by the church. There's something about their experience with church life that have caused them to say, that's just nothing but a bunch of hypocrites, judgmental people. They have a, a disillusionment towards organized religion. According to them, the church is hypocritical. You see, if you were to ask the average non-Christian in our area why they don't believe in Jesus, not far into that conversation, that's the answer that you're going to get. If you ask the average person who claims to be a Christian but refuses to go to church, that's their answer, too. Oftentimes, they're going to say that the church is hypocritical, two-faced, judgmental. So we've got to ask ourselves the question, are they right? Is the church actually hypocritical? Is the world justified in calling the church a hypocritical huddle of holier-than-thous? Would your friend, your neighbor, your co-worker, would they be right in calling you a hypocrite? I want us to think seriously about this question this morning because it has eternal ramifications. If we all are just a bunch of hypocrites who get together once a week, shame on us. Because that's not the message that is intended to be from the church. That's certainly not the message that Jesus gave the church. And so let's think seriously this morning. If one of the leading reasons that people reject Jesus is because of the hypocrisy found among Christians, let's be sure that we're not in that statistic. And if we are, then let's be sure that we repent quickly for the sake of the gospel and the glory of the name of God. In our time together this morning, I want to proclaim two things to you. First, the hypocrite is detestable to God. Second, there is hope even for hypocrites like us. But let's begin with the hypocrisy that we see in David's life. We look with me again in verse 1. 
Now the Philistines gathered together all the armies of Af to Aphek, and the Israelites pitched by a fountain which is in Jezreel. And the lords of the Philistines passed by on hundreds and by thousands, but David and his men passed by on the re-reward with Achish. If you'll remember, uh, this is going back two chapters from now. David is in a little bit of a pickle. Uh, for the past year and four months, he's been deceiving Achish. Okay? King Achish, we were introduced to him a, a while ago. He's been lying to Achish. Achish has been asking David to go on various raids, many of them including the nation of Israel. But David has not done that, right? What's David done instead? Well, he has gone on raids of other enemy cities and actually slaughtered every single person in those cities so that no one could go back to Achish and tell them what he's been doing. So Achish says to David, as this chapter opens up, listen, I'm done with raids. I'm done with that. I, I want to start a war. I think we're in a good enough position, fighting position, that we can go ahead and overcome Israel. Let's go to war. Me, you, let's wipe Israel off the map. And so that's the current plan. That's the beginning of chapter 28. And David gives this kind of noncommittal answer. He says, you know what I can do, but doesn't really commit to actually going to do anything. And David begins to pack his things and begins to rack his brain. How am I going to get out of this? Because remember, David loves Israel. He doesn't want to harm Israel. But now he's so convinced Achish that he's on Achish's side, they call him to go to battle with him. In front of King Achish, David has been living this double life. He's been a hypocrite for a year and four months, saying to the Philistines, I'm on your side, I'm on your side, I'm on your side. While secretly saying to himself and his buddies, no, we're, we're really pulling for Israel. David is so good at playing both sides. Achish says of David that he is going to serve me for the rest of his life. He's convinced. David was an excellent hypocrite. In public, he played the part perfectly. And in private, he was another person altogether. He said one thing to Achish while saying a different thing to his friends. While David had convinced Achish... The rest of the Philistine leaders, well, they were not so sure that they could trust David. Look at me in verse 3. Then said the princes of the Philistines, what do these, what do these Hebrews hear? And Achish said unto the princes of the Philistines, is not this David, the servant of Saul, the king of Israel, which hath been with me these days or these years? And I have found no fault in him since he fell unto me unto this day. In other words, Achish is trying to convince him, don't you trust me? This guy's been running with me for a year or for a year or so now. He's good. He's good. Look with me in verse 4. And the princes of the Philistines were wroth with him. And the princes of the Philistines said unto him, make this fellow return, that he may go again to his place which thou hast appointed him. Let him not go down to battle with us. Why do they not want David to go down to battle with them? Lest in the battle he be an adversary to us. For wherewith should he reconcile himself unto his master? Should it not be with the heads of these men? Is not this David of whom they sang one to another in dances, saying Saul slew his thousands and David his ten thousands? What if he turns on us? The rest of the Philistine leaders, they didn't trust David. From their perspective, David was the killer of the greatest warrior they had, Goliath. Remember, Goliath was on the Philistines' team, and now he's been known for killing tens of thousands of Philistines. They see David as an unnecessary risk in this war. What if he flips back to the other side when we start fighting? What if he comes against us? Achish, don't be a fool. Send him away. Be done with this guy. So Achish brings the news to David, and I want you to hear just how good David is at hypocrisy, because Achish is sold out on David, believes David is just the cream of the crop, the best guy you could ever get to know. Listen, listen as he, as he talks about him in verse 6. Then Achish called David and said unto him, surely as the Lord liveth. Thou hast been upright, has he? And thy going out and thy coming in with me and the host is good in my sight. Is it really? For I have not found evil in thee since the day of thy coming unto me unto this day. Nevertheless, the Lord's favor thee not. Wherefore now return and go in peace that thou displease not the lords of the Philistines. 
And David, adding to the hypocrisy, David said unto Achish, But what have I done? If only he knew. And what hast thou found in the, thy servant so long as I have been with thee unto this day, that I may not go fight against the enemies of my lord, the king? Achish answered and said to David, I know that thou art good in my sight as an angel of God. Notwithstanding, the princes of the Philistines have said, he shall not go, go up with us unto battle. Achish is he's convinced, absolutely convinced that David is a trustworthy, upright God that is going to fight for the Philistines. Did you hear what he thinks? He sees David as this ally on mission to defeat Israel, but, but David has been lying to him the whole time. He's been playing him. And let me remind you that David is not acting on God's marching orders. David is not, he's not trying to survive by lying to this king. He isn't wearing a mask to protect his own people. David chose to go into enemy territory. He made that choice, not God. David chose to sign up as Achish's henchmen. He chose to murder innocent people. David has not been upright. David has done evil since the meeting of Achish. David is a hypocrite. He's a pretender. He's a faker. Do you know the Bible has a lot to say about hypocrisy? More than I even realized when I began to search for that term in Scripture. If you were to summarize it all, the Bible teaches that hypocrisy is when you pretend to be something different in public than you really are in private. Matthew chapter 23, Jesus uses that term over and over again when talking to the Pharisees. Seven times in that one chapter, Jesus calls these religious leaders hypocrites. Why? Well, he summarizes it in Matthew chapter 23. This is what he says. He says, for they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. Hypocrites, they preach but do not practice. They talk the talk on Sunday, but they do not walk the walk on Monday. Publicly, they're very different from the people who they are privately, in their homes and in their hearts. And before you begin to nudge your neighbor saying, I hope you're listening to this, examine yourself. Because if we're honest, we all have at least a little vein of hypocrisy running through us. Let me ask you, have you ever told someone I'm praying for you when in reality all you have done is felt sorry for them? Your public and your private life don't line up. In that instance, you would have been a hypocrite. Have you ever held a grudge against someone refusing to forgive them? That's hypocrisy for the Christian who privately asks God for forgiveness but is unwilling to publicly give it to others. Have you ever stood in this congregation and saying, great is thy faithfulness, with a big smile plastered on your face, only to go home and fret over how you're going to pay the bills? See, every time that you pretend to be something different in public than you are in private, you're practicing hypocrisy. Now, that is not to say that every single time you struggle, you're being a hypocrite. That's not the case. Every Christian is a struggling Christian. We're all sinners, right? We agree with that. But the hypocrite pretends that he isn't. The hypocrite is always good, no matter how good their day is going. The hypocrite is always holy, always done the, everything they're supposed to do. The hypocrite is always perfect. The hypocrite is always better than his neighbor and would never call themselves the chief of sinners, as Paul does church family, I'm sad to say that the excuse the world gives for not following Jesus is not entirely unfounded. We all are hypocritical from time to time. We pretend. We like to give the impression that we've got everything figured out. So what are we supposed to do? What needs to change so that we can send the right message to the watching world? I believe it begins by saying, I was before we start saying you are. You see, the church in America has gained this reputation of being a you are church. You are a sinner. You are lost. You are broken. You are going to hell if you don't repent. And while all that may be true, it's not the whole message, is it? With each you are, we begin to elevate ourselves over whoever we're talking to. 
I think we need to begin the conversation with I was before we get to you are. I was lost. I was a sinner. I struggled. I was broken. I was on my way to hell. I was a hypocrite. But then I met Jesus. And he changed everything for me. He forgave my sin and healed my brokenness. And yes, I still fail. I don't hide and pretend anymore. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And then you go to the you are. You are lost, just like I was. You are broken, just like I was. And let me tell you about the one who can fix that, who can heal that, who can bring restoration to that. That ought to be the church message. That ought to be what we're saying to people. Not you are, you are, you are, but I was, Jesus is, and now you can be. That ought to be the message. Brothers and sisters, the next time you're ready to cast the first stone at the sinner, would you remember that you're not without your own sin? Yes, your sins may look different, but its effects are the same. As Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, before you condemn someone for an adulterous relationship, remember that every lustful or envious look you give is adultery in your own heart. None of us are without sin. The only thing that separates us from the world is the grace of God. And hypocrites just hide that fact. Christians ought to be honest about it. Tragically, there are some of you in this room who came to church playing a hypocritical game. You sing the songs, you pray the prayers, you'll even shake hands with people. You attend Bible study, but when you get home, there are no songs in your heart, there are no prayers lifted up, your words don't bless the Lord, you just curse men, your Bible, well, it's going to collect dust for the next seven days until you do it all again. Friends, that is hypocrisy. Be warned. If you're playing that game, Jesus asks a terrifying question for the hypocrite in Matthew chapter 23 as he lays out the list. He says, you serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? God does not take kindly to hypocrites. And for good reason. They're glory thieves. If you think about it, when you act differently in public than you do in private, it's usually for this reason. So that people think better of you. To get recognition. To get people to think that you're better than you really are. We love it when people will applaud us. When they'll pat us on the back. They'll like our social media posts. They lift us up. In short, we are tempted to pretend in order to get glory. And glory only belongs to God. We know that, right? God will not share his glory with another. We know that, right? So to quote the warning of Job, chapter 27, verse 10, for what is the help of the hypocrite that he hath gained when God taketh away his soul? Yes, it is true. You can get away with hypocrisy for a long time. And you even stand to gain a few things along the way. David gets away with it. Did you notice that in this whole story? David plays the part of the hypocrite so well, and he still gets away with it. Look with me in verse 10. Wherefore, now rise up early in the morning with thy master's servants that are come to thee. And as soon as ye be up early in the morning and have light and depart. So David and his men rose up early to depart in the morning and return. Where does David go? Back to the land of the Philistines. He's going to keep playing his game. Returns to the land of the Philistines, and the Philistines went up to Jezreel. Yes, you can play the part of a hypocrite. You can be really good. You can get away with it for years and years and years and years. But at some point, your ruse will come to an end. I pray that it comes to an end before you meet God standing in his throne room when there's no hope left. At that point, it will be too late. There would be no hope when your soul is taken away, as Job tells us. But what hope is there for the hypocrite now? That's a good question. What hope is there for us when we're hypocritical? What hope is there for David now that he has sinned so much against God? The hope of David is the hope of every Christian. Jesus offers hope for hypocrites like us. You see, Jesus has a long track record of forgiving hypocritical actions. If you don't believe me, just, just ask Zacchaeus. 
Y'all know the story of him, Zacchaeus. Why did everybody hate Zacchaeus? It wasn't because he's a wee little man. Has no reason to hate anybody. <laughs> Y'all shouldn't have laughed that long at that one. The reason they hated Zacchaeus is because he was a hypocrite. He was a traitor. He was an unfair tax collector. That's why so many people were upset when Jesus did what? He went to Zacchaeus' house, had lunch with him, sat down with him. And they would ask Jesus, why are you spending so much time with such a hypocrite? And Jesus answered the questions. And those looking on, he said, well, I came to save hypocrites like him. I came to seek and save the lost. I came to die for people like Zacchaeus and to die for people like us too. Jesus will even redeem the hypocrisy of David. Did you know that it's soon to be King David? It's him that will receive the promise that an everlasting king, an everlasting throne will come through his lineage. It's David who will be, the, be in the family tree of the forever, never pretending King Jesus. God redeems the story of David, even when he's being a hypocrite. Jesus gives hope to hypocrites like us all. In high school, I was a, a leader in my youth group. I was the president of the Christian club in my school. Everyone knew that I was planning to go to school to be a pastor. I was given chances to speak at different youth groups. I was really good at being good, except for one small hidden detail about my life. Throughout all my years of high school, I was living in unrepentant sin. Publicly, I was what, I was applauded for my holiness, but privately, I was a hypocrite. That is, until one Sunday morning, I was stopped on the way to Sunday school, and I was asked to go to my youth pastor's office. I thought maybe I was getting an award or something. In that meeting, my hypocrisy was found out, and I heard the devastating words from my youth pastor that I, I don't think I can recommend you go to seminary at this point. If this is all true, my private life had come to light, and honestly, I deserved every bit of punishment that was coming my way. It's through this experience that I learned that Jesus offers hope even to hypocrites like me. Because I was given a chance to confess my sin to my youth pastor, the ones that I had sinned against, and hardest of them all, I was given a chance to confess my sin to my mom. You see, that morning, I was supposed to be going to Sunday school, ended up in the youth pastor's office, and I didn't feel much like going to church the rest of that day. So I went home, and I uh, walked in, and my mom was there getting ready for church. She sang in the choir, and she was getting everything ready, and I just, I just broke down on her. And she asked what was wrong. I messed up. That's all I could get out. So I messed up. And what I should have gotten was, when I, was not what I received. I should have been punished. I should have been cast out. I should have been talked down to. I should have been judged. I should have been condemned. But my mom just wrapped me up in her arms and said, it's, it'll be okay. She still loved me. It'll be okay. Church family, if you are living in a hidden, hypocritical life, and you've been getting away with it for years and years and years, and you don't know what's going to happen if you actually were to confess your sin, let me tell you, Jesus offers hope to you today. You can come to him. You can confess your sins, and he will say to you, not get out, but it's okay. Okay love you. I still love you. Brothers and sisters, Jesus died for every hypocritical thought, every word, every deed that you will ever do. Jesus shared the Last Supper with a table full of hypocrites and even offered forgiveness to each and every one of them. So we come to him today and find forgiveness. Pray to him the old Puritan prayer, help me to be in reality before thee as I am in appearance before men. If you're here this morning and your hypocrisy is that you've been coming to church, you've been playing the part of a Christian without actually placing your faith in Jesus. Will you let today be the day that you give up the act? Let today be the day that you stop pretending and you say, well, pastor, what will people think? First off, who cares what people think? 
Your first concern should not be what other people think of you, but what God knows of you. And let me tell you, God knows the truth. He knows when you're hiding. He knows when you're pretending. And he still offers you forgiveness by the sacrifice of his son if you'll simply come to him. And let me let you in on a little secret that the devil doesn't want you to know. If you really want to know what people will think, if you were to come and give your life to Jesus, even if you've been coming here for years and years and years, let me tell you what they will think. They will think, praise God. They will think, fill up the baptistry. They'll think, hallelujah, what a savior. Friend, we want to rejoice with you, not judge you. We want to give God all the glory for saving yet another hypocrite like us. So will you place your faith in Jesus today? And find the hope that Jesus offers to you. In just a moment, we're going to open up this altar for a time of of reflection and response to God's word. And so, if you don't know Jesus, if you've been playing a game for years and years and years, here's what you need to do. When the music begins, will you come forward? Come and tell that to God. Come tell it to me, and I'll help you pray to God about that. And Jesus will save your soul today. Christian, if you've been playing the game, yes, you trust Jesus, but you have just been absolutely putting on a front for the past couple of weeks, months, maybe years. Will you come and confess that to your Savior? He will once again forgive your sin. He offers hope for hypocrites like us. Let's pray together, church. Our Father, how desperately we need you. And we're tempted to be pretending and faking our lives. When in actuality, you call us to be humble in our pursuance of holiness. God, would you give us more and more of the grace of Jesus, as he is our only hope. We love you. We trust you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
Thank you so much for joining us in worship today. I want you to know that's true. Just as you are. No more games, no more hiding. Just as you are, Christ will take you and save your soul. And you don't have to do it right here in a church building. Talk to any Christian. They would love to tell you about how to follow Jesus. If you will please remain standing, we're going to take a moment to retire the colors. Thank you. Uh, Jesse, would you mind to close us out in prayer?